Gameplay spoilers for TMS ahead. Proceed with your own caution. Why did you guys lie to me about this game? It's actually rad as hell. Yeah, I'm being deadass here. Tokyo Mirage Sessions is good, and I am an unapologetic TMS fan. Obviously, I don't like everything about it. It's weird, kinda shallow, and a little strange, but at the end of it all, it is just fun. Pure fun. Though, that wasn't how I always saw TMS. At first, I, like many people, hated this game for being what it wasn't instead of what it, you know, actually was. Or in professional terms, I was cringe. But after giving it a chance, I found a lot to love about this game on its own and I think more people should be willing to give the game a chance. So yes, I am here to judge TMS as the product we were given, what it does not so good and so, so right. If you're looking for a video on why TMS sucks because it's not what you wanted, shoot, I don't want you here, go to another vid. Also, before moving on, I am not a Fire Emblem fan, so this is a video from the POV of an SMT fan, and in some cases, the points might not hit as close for you. But wait, why do people even hate this game, asked the person behind you. Well, let me tell you the story of a game supposedly no one asked for. One day, Fate was randomly throwing darts. On the dartboard was a ton of potential video game crossovers, and whichever one she threw the dart on would be the next big crossover. She happened to land one of her darts on SMT Cross Fire Emblem, two equally bad big series. Then she threw another dart, landing on Make It About Idols, leaving us with Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE. People hate this game, but why? I mean, if Archie can meet the Predator, who says Marth can't dance to Go My Way from Idol Master, while Jack Frost SMT goes up against a deconstructive look that is the messed up world of idols? Well, it's mainly because Atlas pulled the biggest Atlas that Atlas has ever atlas What I mean is that TMS was first revealed during a Nintendo Direct, where they basically said, uh, we're making an SMT Fire Emblem crossover. Yeah! We have no idea what it will be about, but it exists. Everyone was hyped. Not me though, I at the time was still struggling with how to even pronounce Shin Megami Tensei. You know, without my brain becoming this. And then after announcing the crossover, what came next? Nothing. We had to wait two whole years as impossibly high expectations came to be, and then it was revealed to be Kawashi Tai. Now people hate it and still do for being not what they wanted, the long wait, and the censorship, among other reasons, giving the game a weird stigma in both fandoms. Rightfully so to some extent, it was a pretty poor decision of Nintendo and Atlas to reveal the project so early. They kinda gave fans a lot of time to create stupidly big expectations with an infinite amount of possibilities, so that one's on them. It's understandable though that people would get super pissed when the first trailer dropped, but even now, people give this game way too much shit, proclaiming it to be the downfall of SMT and Atlas. The worst thing they've ever done with literally zero good redeeming qualities about it. No? And that's not a straw man by the way, I have actually met people like this. And even though fans bickered and bickered, the game still came out in 2015, reviewing rather well with the critics, but because being a hater is almost a superpower and many unimportant factors like demographics and marketing, the game bombed hard everywhere. Now, Jesus, seven years later, the game even after an enhanced Switch release, still continues to be given ire by SMT and Fire Emblem fans. So is there actually anything in this game that might deservedly make people upset? And what does it do to get my approval? Well, the story's not really one of them. Yeah, I know I ripped off that band-aid rather quickly, but um, I'll explain what I mean later, but I think I got to, you know, give you the basic premise of what the game's story is actually about. Well, it starts with two people singing, and then everyone disappears, except the little girl, which I could imagine would result in years of therapy. Also, this event is called the Mass Disappearance. In actuality, kinda. TMS starts with student Tsubasa, the girl who needed therapy, and, spoiler alert, we're not sure if she got any, attending an idol audition with her friend Itsuki tagging along. The host of the audition turns out to be evil, for he is ugly, and ugly people can't ever be the heroes. This devilish deed involves stealing everyone in the audience's performer, which is kinda like, person's entire creativity, so that's no good. I mean, look at what it does. Anyways, Mr. Bed seals Tsubasa, and Itsuki follows along into this place called the Idolosphere, the place where Peter Griffin's otherworldly shadowy figures come from, mirages. While in the Idolosphere, Itsuki and Tsubasa, with the help of their friend Toma, famous idol Kidia, and a woman named Maiko, the two are able to escape the Idolosphere, awaken to the power of the Rasengan, get these ugly as hell costumes, like what the actually are these things. And join Maiko's agency, Fortuna Entertainment, to fight the evil Mirages as Mirage Masters, which is pretty much what it sounds like. They've mastered the Mirages. Haha! <laughs> and way more importantly, become slay girls. Also, as the new blood of Fortuna Entertainment, we gain access to this place where this unique mirage called Tiki resides. Tiki here runs the Cathedral of Light. She can't really leave her position, but she's alright with that. She acts as a little 
Nexus character and support in the most literal way as she helps us with getting better weapons and builds for combat. We bid our girl boss idols for an upcoming event, Maiko grants us lessons at the Uzume studio where we meet Barry, who is annoying and the less I say about him, the better. Sometime around the lesson though, a big mirage attack happens at the event and we have to go save the world's creativity. And from here on out, we do what we can to stop mirage attacks and investigate why they're happening, usually being of the idol variety. But who's our cast? Well, there's Itsuki, our SMT protagonist, a mostly blank slate, blander than a bowl of oatmeal, and no way near as thick as one, except he talks a lot, so let's hear what he has to say. Hello, Mario. Riveting. There's Tsubasa, she's auditioning to become an idol of sorts, hoping to make everybody happy and follow in her missing sister's footsteps. She's not the most interesting, but probably my favorite of the cast. There's Toma. We've also got Kiria, a popular idol who is a cool composed mystique, but a softer side. She's alright. Maiko, aforementioned director of Fortuna and Mirage Investigator, who looks a little ill-fitting for her job, but she does it very well. She's funny, but a little shallow. Dude, why can't I be Mirage Master? Because you're comic relief! There's Tiki, who we've already discussed, and Barry, a pretty whatever, if inoffensive cast. Getting back to the story, this mirage attack is being performed by the work of Tsubasa's missing ghost sister, Spooky. That's not her name, it's just, you know, that's how I describe it. We follow her into the Idolosphere for our first real dungeon, and along the way, rescue a few people like this TV producer named whatever his name is on the clip on screen, and run into Tsubasa's sister a few more times, but I don't care about that at all. And because I'm just too epic for a game about idols, we make it through the rest of the dungeon, where at the top of that one building in Shibuya, Yep, it's him. And it turns out she's being mind controlled by a powerful mirage named Aversa, which Tsubasa responds by singing or something, weakening Aversa's control over her sister and allowing us to fight Aversa. With the window open, we promptly kick Aversa's ass in, wherever it might be, and hey, since we got rid of Aversa, we put an end to the trouble in Shibuya, saved Tsubasa's sister, got stronger, learned more about mirages in the Idolosphere, finished the first chapter of Tokyo Mirage Sessions, and of course, leave our negative review on Metacritic and complain on some forms. So yeah, that's pretty much how it goes though. Normal idle stuff usually involves not being able to do idle things correctly, mirage thing happens, problem gets solved by character learning how to do normal idle thing correctly, and learn more about the mirages. I was watching some Kappa Mikey not too long ago, and I could see the writing team of TMS took a lot of cues from it. I mean, it's literally the same structure. Thank god for Atlas and Nintendo. I mean, not aware, but I don't think Viacom plays RPGs. But I sure as hell do, so everyone loses here. As for my thoughts on the story so far, it's uh, whatever. Not bad, but not impressive either. It gets the job done, giving us an idea of what to expect. Mediocrity that knows it's mediocre and doesn't try to be anything more. Far from being mediocre though is the gameplay because oh my god it's so good. TMS's gameplay mainly revolves around getting through a boatload of unique dungeons, ranging from mid to awesome, and throughout you'll be required to partake in a turn-based combat system that reveals that this is where all the SMT part of the crossover went. So much so it makes exploiting weaknesses a core part of its system. But it's not all SMT and its combat, it does use the FE triangle system, which that's it. Sorry Fire Emblem fans, but uh, I need this, uh, you, you guys will know why later. The combat system is actually a full web of crossovers in and of itself, as it mainly uses a mix of Digital Devil Saga's party count and how you get new weapons and skills, Strange Journey's demon co-op system, Personas Personas with them being Mirages, and a bunch of other stuff I just threw up on screen. Saying this kind of makes it sound like a mess, but it's not, it's actually a whole lot of fun, it somehow comes together to form its own identity. In combat, you'll mainly be using EP skills either for buffing, healing, and most importantly magic to activate sessions. By exploiting the enemy's weakness, you'll be able to perform what is called a session attack where your party members help you all attack the enemy determined by the session slots in that party member's mirage. Example, you hit an enemy with wind weakness, then you start a session because your party has a session skill that allows them to join in when wind is used, which creates a domino effect where session skills lead into another, repeat this to create better, stronger chains. Pulling off sessions is crucial to surviving in TMS, which is good because it's fun too. Less vital but still important are the many other types of moves, such as special performance skills, ad-lib performances, and duo arts. You get these later in the game through side quests or talking to Maiko at specific points in Fortuna. These are easily missable for some reason. In Fortuna though is the Bloom Palace, which is fucked because they should have called it the Cathedral of Light. I mean it was literally right there, but whatever. As this implies, this is where you get your stronger weapons which give you new skills the more you use them, passive add-ons, and class changes, which not being a Fire Emblem fan, 
I did not know that means you get stronger instead of changing your class of skills and starting from square one or something like that. Oops, oh, that's on me. In a game about idols and stuff, equipment is pretty important in this game. If you don't manage it correctly, you will die, and you won't be able to slay with your amazing fashion sense. Seriously, the stupid outfits you get in TMS are one of the best parts of the game. You can get them in a special dungeon or in the store at Harajuku. Last are the side quests and side stories meant to further develop the cast. There are optional pieces of content, not really, you know, necessary to progress, but help enrich the world, or so they may seem, because the side quests are kind of boring barring some of the side stories. As bloated as TMS can seem, the game is just really fun at its base level. The core combat is fun thanks to pulling from all over SMT's gameplay history and gets a lot more fun the farther you get into the game. Dungeons are mixed but mostly solid as hell thanks to some interesting mechanics and another point I am going to go on for a little while, so I'll save it for later. The only real negative as of now is that the side content can kinda suck, something you mostly do for the rewards, you know? No secret, but this game is very fun, but before I could really tell you why, I have a story to get back to. Or so I was planning to. Instead of that, I'm going to get into my critiques. I apologize, if you want a video with an entertaining plot summary of TMS with a good dash of analysis, I recommend Strain42's video on the game, he makes some pretty good stuff. If you're wondering why I'm not going all in with the story of the game, it's just mainly because I really don't want to. Not out of any sense of laziness, of course. I had an entire version of the script written where I had an entire summary and it was really funny, but that's that's just not why I like TMS, and I didn't want to spend so long talking about something I really just didn't feel too passionate about. If anything, I'm more passionate about how the story made me feel in a meta sense, as stupid as that sounds. Not really anything within the story, but the overall tone and presentation. It's not trying to be anything super special, nor does it act like it is. It's silly, and it knows it's silly. And if you think this makes it immune from criticism, hell no, of course it doesn't. Obviously, I didn't really like the game's story that much if I'm willing to rewrite the whole script to avoid it, but the point is, sometimes you just gotta chill, and TMS is fully on board with that. It's just, you know, trying to give you a good time. But what about the criticisms? What's up with that? As a mediocre story, I checked out a while ago. Nothing about the story, characters, or dilemma was really entertaining. Not good, entertaining. It made me laugh a little and the localization team did a pretty good job of portraying how people text each other in English. I don't know how it works in Japanese. But other than those occasional chuckles, I was just on autopilot for the whole game. And it wasn't horrible either, so I couldn't really point and laugh at it. It set the standards to be below average and by God, did it meet those standards. It mostly understands how plot structure, characters, foreshadowing, all that works, but barely does it do anything entertaining with them. Like Tsubasa, she goes from wanting to be an idol to struggling and triumphing over many hurdles to becoming an idol by the end. Nothing less and nothing more. And thinking further about this, what really makes me feel this way is that the game was likely intending me to just have a good time fanboying. Problems are, there are zero elements of SMT lore or characters, I don't like Fire Emblem, and we're talking about the story, so... Yes, I'm aware this part is very opinion based, but even if the story isn't good, I could have at least been able to enjoy myself by pointing at the screen and going, WOWZA! Over the fan service like that new Spider Man movie, you know? Fire Emblem fans are likely going like that, but as an SMT fan, there's nothing in its story, so I'm just here, not entertained by the story presented, nor are there any SMT lore things to keep my brain going, ooh, 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 ooh. So in the story department, it fails the concept crossover with around. 85 to 95% being Fire Emblem, a percentage I do not care about. And before you say it, Kingdom Hearts managed to do this way before TMS. There's a good mix of both Disney and Final Fantasy in that game's story. If TMS had more SMT elements to its story and still remained this standard, I would have enjoyed the story a little more would have been very artificial, but it would have worked with the bog standard story. So after ranting about this game's story for like a few minutes, why do I like this game's gameplay enough to place it over DDS1 on my tier list and want you all to play it? And where the hell did the SMT part of this SMT Fire Emblem crossover go? We'll just uh, peel off the skin, and oh, that's where it is. Okay, so back to the game part of this game, what I'm really frothing at the mouth to talk about. So if I'm gonna start this off, I wanna go in swinging. What's a better way to start the day than a hard slap to the face as you get up? Maybe a cold bucket of water, but I can't afford that. Anyways, the session mechanic is a fun take on SMT with a bit of Fire Emblem thrown in there. Similar to Strange Journey, it uses the system where one person hits an enemy's weakness, more people start joining in based on what session skill they have. You know, when you hit them with a nice move, it starts creating a domino effect of more moves leading to more moves, yeah, yeah, yeah. While it might not have the on-the-fly thinking similar to the press turn system, it manages to be just as fun because of how satisfying it can be to chain attacks together, and seeing how big your sessions get as the game goes on. It might not start out the best, but it really does get fun later on. Like, it's still fun, gives me a little smile early on, and then wham, it just gets even more fun. I just wish it could have been like that from the start, you know? 
Similarly unique are the many dungeons of TMS. Not to say that they're good, I mean hell, only like what, one or two of the dungeons even reach a level of great, but man these dungeons are just fun, you know, fun to go through, I've been using that word a lot today. Once again, they each have unique gimmicks that are just really fleshed out like the first dungeon's costumes and traveling through them by changing the position. Their aesthetics are creative as hell, like god damn this looks sick, and the mechanics are based on the area's theme, so double sick. They also reward you for exploration with good items and aren't annoying to find since there are no random encounters. You could choose who you want to fight, like, like hit them and run away in the overworld, it's cool, but not all of them are great. The Japanese house is just kinda whatever since it's mostly boring fetch quests between rooms, but still visually sick as hell, I really love this. TV studios rather whatever, just having you remember paths on a map, though figuring out what it means at first is cool, it just kinda loses its luster after a bit. I do like the stuff with the panels later on, that stuff is cool like only one section but I still like it. But if you were here for the last real video, the game ends with one of my favorite dungeons in the series. It introduces a lot of cool stuff and doesn't really do anything super well but it just does a lot of stuff and that stuff is just fun. Mainly the sliding blocks, the one-way paths, and teleporter mazes. Although it may not focus on one thing in particular, they do all fall under the theme of how well you are in navigating dungeons. And very importantly, it never gets annoying because the dungeon, in all honesty, is really short compared to most other final dungeons in the series. Like it's still long, but it feels short, and it looks pretty, which some of you might already know. Okay, I saved this tangent, but oh my god I love the way this game looks. Carnage form, designs aside, everything about this game looks great. Colors, models, the stupid outfits you could wear, but you know I love the way these dungeons look. They're so cool and creative, blending film and fantasy in such a cool way, peaking with the traditional Japanese house dungeon and final one for me. Also, the UI for this game is gorgeous. I could see why SMT5 used such heavy inspiration from it. If I had to describe it, it manages to take J-pop culture, turn it into a cell phone theme, and it, I can just not get enough of it. But art isn't fun, it sucks. What actually contributes to the fun factor for me is that it's actually a really challenging game. On my first playthrough, almost every end dungeon boss I ran into gave me a lot of shit. I more often than not had to really think, okay, how am I gonna fight this guy? Well, I do think the game's challenge might have gone a bit overboard in some places. When it hits that sweet spot, oh my god, it's so much fun and satisfying. And when it does spike, it can get really irritating. It can become less of an issue on following playthroughs, and I say can because of another point soon to come. Even if the bosses might suck on the rare occasion, they're all so unique. Even at their worst, I can remember most of the bosses' gimmicks off the top of my head. Aversa being a simple but still unique fight with her summoning enemies and you have to deal with that. Gangrel summoning enemies that have to take hits for him, so you're gonna have to deal with them before you deal with him. Yashiro splitting himself into copies, so you're gonna have to, you know, figure out how to take care of those and figure out which one the real one is, and when they start like all being part of the same one. That one guy with the TV face swapping affinities, also Yashiro is there. Garnuff and his spinny blades of DOOM! Well yeah, on my first playthrough, they might have pissed me off. On this recent playthrough, I was having so much fun figuring out how to best fight these guys. But this also leads me into my next issue because the game doesn't emphasize enough how important swapping characters in combat is until you realize it is too late, nor utilize it early enough. I should preface this by saying half of this is a really personal point that I think leads to a debatable issue. It's likely most people won't have this issue, and in the reviews I've seen, most people don't bring it up but I still think that it's something the game could have done better at. A brief reminder on how swapping works in TMS. In the game, characters are allowed to swap out with one another without wasting a turn, thus allowing for you to adjust to the situation to deal with an enemy. It's great for when you can't start a session, or a party member's HP is a little too low, and also helps distribute EXP and mastery throughout the characters. I'm aware that the game does tell you about swapping and its importance, how to best use it to your advantage, implying its significance through other means such as a very limited EXP share, and later boss fights necessitating it, so it doesn't come out of complete nowhere, but that last bit is really where the issue remains. TMS establishes very, very, very briefly how swapping works and when you want to do it, and then proceeds to not make it super important in fights and progress until way later into the game, like around chapter 4, a point when you would either give up on the game, grind up some characters that you left in the back, or do some sacrilegious shit to progress, all of which are annoying. Once more, this is a very personal point and not many people do bring it up so it might not bother you as much, but I think other than being the game equivalent of foreshadowing that the random but slightly off wagey in the convenience store is the bad guy, it also has a stench of missed opportunity which upsets me even more because a lot of those fights later in the game, the ones that require you to get tricky with swapping, are some of the best fights and using those mechanics from the start would have made the already sick boss fights even cooler. Sure, it might have been a little too much for some at the start, but it would have done a lot to fix this issue I have with the game, and at this point of the script, I started playing Final Fantasy X and that game literally does everything I just described. It better presents how important changing your party's composition during battle is, it does it from the start, and you'll have the bitchiest time progressing if you don't play by the game's rules. 
It feels like TMS wanted to do that, but fumbled there due to not committing to it from the start. Another reason I think that's the case is because unlike FF10, you can't switch Itsuki out until the second playthrough, so that feels a little more restrictive and could lessen the fun factor even if the game is still designed around him being in your party. Point is, I think that the character changing for battles is a really underutilized idea for a majority of the game. Not helping it is how underestablished it could personally feel. As for the biggest of blunders, I sure hope nobody got fired for since getting fired is bad, but are still pretty upsetting, is that some characters are noticeably better slash worse than others. This is more so an excuse for me to bitch about Kirio because I used her on my first playthrough and she dies really fast. She could be seen as a glass cannon, but she's more of a glass super soaker, meaning she rarely gets me big numbers and dies really fast. And I hate her even more as a fighter because I wasn't aware of the swapping mechanic. But for this playthrough, I went with Mamari, who is actually insane. For starters, she's the most defensive character in the game. Nothing can stop her, she's literally the juggernaut. Her axe skills are great, including one that allows her to lower the enemies of defense upon contact, which she could power up using charge. She has access to both Tetra Guard and Makara Guard, which prevents magic and physical moves from damaging the party at all. She can protect others from getting hit with a move dedicated to activating it, and lastly, her SP skills are cracked. The first one which fully restores the party and allows her to act again, which costs a single point of the SP bar. The next one allows her to fully restore the party and revive any dead party members and act again, also at the cost of one SP bar. And her last SP skill allows her to raise everyone's defense and offense, and can block any and all elements for three turns. If you want a textbook example of not judging a book by its cover, here you go, Mamari TMS. Jesus Christ, she's way too powerful. I'm the Jumano, bitch! As for my minor quibbles, dual arts and adlibs are cool. They're random chance moves that could really turn the tide of battle, but I'm conflicted. Great when they happen, but very empty feeling, similar to the Showtime attacks in Persona 5. But unlike there, you have to earn them in TMS, so how do you do it? You talk to Maiko at her desk sometimes, cool. Also side stories too, that's the other way. And the side stories and side quests are just kind of lame. Some of them have super unique and cool content, but most of them just are just like, you know, kill blank amount of enemies and then cutscenes. You mainly do these for the rewards, which are really good. Sometimes they don't have any combat and it's just cutscenes, which is cool. I like that we get a window into these characters' lives and where the game could really be funny. Another feeling of confliction because I really do like when they make new stuff with the side stories because it's really good. So I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. While its story might have let me down, Tokyo Mirage Sessions picks up hard in its gameplay. As a Mega Ten fan, I am more than glad with how this game turned out in terms of gameplay. From its great dungeons, challenging bosses, and great combat system, Tokyo Mirage Sessions just knows how to give you a fun ass time. But which version do you play, no one is asking, because, you know, you can buy the Wii U one or emulate it, but sh 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 If you're wondering which version to play, though, get the Switch version. Sure, you might be supporting Nintendo and paying a little extra, but you'll also be giving Atlas money, and you get all the DLC for free, and new exclusive content. It is the censored version of TMS across all regions that was made for the Western Wii U release, but it really doesn't matter too much. The censorship changes have been covered in great detail on many other videos, but if you want my thoughts, the censorship, while upsetting, isn't a good reason to discredit the game in its entirety, since it's a very minor part of a much larger experience. And you know, I agree. The censorship changes are kind of stupid, like, why would you even censor some of these things? But also, it's not like the censored bits ruin the game's overall message, and even then, it's TMS. What deeper meaning is there, let alone one that was censored? And I get it, it's not what's being censored, it's the fact there's any censorship at all. And while it's admirable to want to fight against the censorship of art, is TMS, of all the games out there, the one you want to use as an example of censorship being bad? Shouldn't we be giving a shit about games that are trying to say more being censored instead of funny idol game? Like, where the hell were you during Tiananmen Square? And Chinese government in general. I agree, censorship sucks, but when arguing against it, pick your battles wisely. And if you're still on the fence about purchasing the game because of the changes, buy it used, sail around, no matter how you play it, the game's not making its money back anytime soon. But you're also missing out on a really fun combat system, so you're lost, bro. But the verdict? Yeah, this game is good. Not a very good story, it's really whatever, and the lack of SMT narrative elements in this SMT cross Fire Emblem game is lame. But the music, presentation, gameplay, all that is solid as hell and well worth your time. While I might have made the game come off as being 50% good and 50% bad with the script, it doesn't change the fact that TMS is just meant to be fun. TMS is not a game to take a deeper meaning from. You go into the game hoping for a fun time and that's exactly what I got, even if I didn't enjoy the story. If you wrote the game off simply because of what it wasn't, then give it a shot. I promise you'll be surprised by the quality of the game itself. 
And if that's not the case, at least you got a pretty cool soundtrack and some kick-ass gameplay. And if you're disappointed by this game's more lax tone, it seems like the team's next project is going to be way more ambitious with Soul Hackers 2, using gameplay mechanics similar to TMS. So hey, consider me hype, cautiously optimistic. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to be epic, drink some water, and buy a copy of Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE Encore for the Nintendo Switch. That is the first time I've said the full title because fuck if I'm gonna say that a bunch of times, and have a good night.